ASEAN Breakfast Call. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Good morning. Hi. Hey, hey Gary. How are you? <laughs> I'm not good. But tomorrow is Deepavali. That's the thing, and I'm down with a very, very bad sore throat. So we'll see how that one goes. Hopefully, I recover by by tonight or something. Hopefully, you get well soon. It reminds me <coughs> of that article by Chili Sauce <coughs> regarding that how kesian Deepavali is, especially when even Gauri is sick. That's right. Is uh, the article actually highlighted a few things which I thought was really interesting, especially the part where we do not really have a Deepavali song. I just realized <laughs> it. That's crazy, you know? I mean, considering, like, every time it's mm. Chinese New Year, Hari Raya, there's always, like, songs blasting from the shopping mall and and all the mm. other commercial buildings. But when it comes to Deepavali, I just realized, even even... Yesterday, I, w- I went to one of the malls nearby and I realized there's not even decorations <laughs> about Deepavali as if like it, things goes on as well. But when it comes to Oktoberfest, Halloween, suddenly like as if it's a Malaysian It's in every festival. shopping mall. Yeah. It is in every shopping mall. And it, another thing that the article highlighted was also the fact that we don't know when Deepavali is every year. I didn't know about that, Gauri. <laughs> That's true. It's, it's <laughs> How did a it even happen? different date every year. It goes according to the Tamil calendar, which, which I'm not too sure how it works. But every year when someone asks me, like, when is Deepavali? You have no idea because it's, it's always <laughs> and different. And I thought Hari Raya was complicated. Right, that's right. <laughs> every time, like, oh, when it's almost Hari Raya, it's like, is the moon out yet? Is the moon out right, yet? <laughs> it's always the moon. <laughs> Actually, but there is something for us too, I, and I'm probably just not aware about it. Perhaps. Well, uh Talking about what is happening around town, as you know, just a, a short, you know, story about what happened oh. yesterday. So the day before yesterday was uh, I want to touch a dog day, which has a funny title to it, and a lot of people enjoy it, especially uh, Malay Muslim, because is it this this is one of the rarest event where they actually talk about touching dogs and as we all know touching dogs is something somehow it is a tab- taboo among the Malay Muslim community and one of the interesting fact that I found out that Jakim is probing mm-hmm. investigation on this event which is funny because it's just an event about I want to touch a dog it's not like I want to kill someone or I want to commit <laughs> corruption and it also goes back to a lot of people say it has to do with your own um, preference. But I also saw um, a lot of comments on Facebook that why do we have this thing when it's against our religion? It's against um, but is the it sensitivity exactly against of the, the country. religion. There is something that is a fine line between that you want to get yourself impure and you are just compassionate towards dogs. I want to touch the dog doesn't mean that you want to touch the poop of the dog. It's just that you mm. are being more compassionate towards animal, in this case, dogs. So perhaps different people have, di- have different understanding about the event. But it is interesting that Jakim is proving investigation on the event because it, it, perhaps it's something that we all would expect. I mean, everybody that was there, they were clearly aware of what they were doing and they were all grown adults they were aware of their religion and they they chose to be there because like you said there is a fine line it's not exactly that they can't touch a dog you know it's only when the dog is is wet or, or something like that yeah, there are certain criteria mm. but that's o- but there's also debatable because some muslims says that it's not even sinful it's nothing even it's not even wrong to touch a dog as long as um, I mean, there are, there are different other ways of interpreting uh, the text. But at the end of the day, I think for Jakim to probing investigation for such an event is totally misplacing priority. Another area that um, that people were trying to make fun of the event is somehow it's a spin-off. Is instead of just, I want to touch a dog, mm-hmm. what about I want to touch whatever race, you know, we put a column, I want to touch a Malay, I want to mm-hmm. touch a Chinese or Indian. The reason why uh, there's this one guy suggesting this, which I thought it was hilarious, but it was at the same time thought-provoking, is because our politics is full of race and religious mm-hmm. sentiments and a lot of people get carried away by it. 
So perhaps an event like that will somehow bridge the gap between different races. Like, hey, there's nothing wrong with their race or mm. our race. It's, you know, we should live together as Malaysians. There was also another one that I saw where they said, what's next after this, you know? Is it I want to touch a pig? <laughs> Which is, that's cute. of course, um, a very sensitive thing as well. But that's that's not the point of this thing. The point of this whole event is not to do what your religion is telling you not to do. It's not to go against anything. I think at the end it's of the day... It's just for some moderation, you know. Don't go too extreme when it comes to... And being to compassionate towards animals. You know, there are some people who are so extreme in their understanding of religion, they would actually kill or beat up these animals because to them, like, it's haram anyway. Why should... Uh, I mean, it's nothing wrong for me to, to, to kill all the dogs. And know? going back to that, there was someone who actually answered to that comment saying that it's not haram because whatever God created is God's creation and we should love every creation from God and nothing is supposed to be haram when it, when it came from God. But if you talk about common sense, mm-hmm. I, I don't think you should kill animal unnecessarily and being compassionate to animal is something that is next to human nature. Another area that it was happening yesterday was Jokowi's inauguration as the new president of Indonesia. And he, uh, of course, it's a new breath of uh, air for Indonesia. We're very happy for the Indonesians. And also, uh, his speech was out recently. In it, it, it was translated into English. And with uh, there's this one... Uh, website. It's not uh, an official translation. It was by rappler.com. Mm. Uh, what is interesting about the text, uh, I, I really want to highlight the text of Jokowi b- partly because it can be a very good example on how uh, any of our candidate ministers, prime ministers, if they want to give speech, this is like the, the kind of speech that they should mm-hmm. be giving. It reminds me a lot of our founding father, uh, Bapak Kemerdekaan, which is uh, Tunku Abdul Rahman, because he ends his speech with Merdeka, which is, uh, I, I don't know about you, but the moment I listen to the, um, the moment I listen mm-hmm. to the YouTube speech, uh, because it was uh, put on YouTube, I started to feel so emotional about it, as if Indonesia is Malaysia. That, that is how uh, touching and grassroots his speech was. And he reached out to a lot of people, not just uh, one class of people. He uh, actually even mentioned uh, D- different. Yeah, he mentioned different profession, uh, and these professions are professions of your everyday mm-hmm. father and mothers, brothers, sisters, even your aunties, your grandmas. This is what he said. Uh, this is this particular uh, paragraph to me. It was really, really. Um, touching, mm-hmm. he said that to the fishermen, laborers, farmers, bakso vendors, bakso mm-hmm. is a famous meat dish uh, of Indonesia, street vendors, drivers, academics, teachers, military, police, entrepreneurs, and professionals, I urge you to work hard, gotong royong, because this is the historic moment for us all to move together, to work, work, and work. We want to present among the independent nations with dignity, with pride. We want to build our own civilization. We want to become a creative nation, a nation that contributes nobility to the world's civilization. If you really look at his art, uh, I mean his whole speech, you don't see the word development, economic development, which I think our prime minister loved to use as much as he can. He used more about, he used more words that grassroots people can connect with you know mm-hmm. the, the idea of working hard contribute as what your profession is you know be uh, work towards creating a creative nation a civilized nation i think that those kind of words really gel well with the rest of society in especially in indonesia considering indonesia is still very much um, a country that has high poverty rate and what's interesting about that is he is he tries to focus on the mindset of the people. Like you said, he didn't talk about economic uh, development, but he talked about people changing their mindset, people um, thinking forward, people, everyone doing their part in contributing to the country. And that will, in turn, affect the economic development of the country. It will. Somehow it will. And I still remember during his campaign, he mentioned a lot about the idea of revolution mental. 
mental revolution. So to him is, we can become like the best uh, infra in terms of infrastructure in the world, like Dubai and all these other countries. But if the people are not up to the standard that we want in terms of creativity, civilization, creating a civilization, working hard and all that, it will not work. So to him, like, if you want to improve the nation, you improve the people. And to improve the people is to empower them, recognize them as whatever profession they are, even if you are a bakso seller. So if I want to put this in the Malaysian context, if Prime Minister Najib Razak mm -hmm. would give a, such a speech, it would be like, to the nasi lemak seller, to mm -hmm. the uncle selling the cha kway teow, to the... <laughs> Sorry. So to the chandol vendor. <laughs> to the chandol vendor. <laughs> I mean, these are noble professions, you know, uh, even though they are just seller on the street, but they are making honest money and they are serving us good food. That, that's also important. And they are the ones who attract most of the tourists to the, to the place, those delicious street food that we're so famous for. Definitely. And, and another area that I thought, I thought Indonesia, uh, I mean, I thought he, he was really serious about Southeast Asia as a whole is uh, one of his, uh, one of the area that he focused is, this is what he said, as the third biggest country in the world with the biggest Muslim population in the world, as an archipelagic nation and the biggest nation in Southeast Asia, Indonesia will keep on practicing a free and active foreign diplomacy for the national interests and contribute in creating a world order in accordance with principles of freedom, eternal peace and social justice. So when he talk about Southeast Asia, he doesn't look at the typical perspective of how uh, how world uh, ASEAN leaders would look at Southeast Asia, which means it's about uh, economic integrity. Uh, sorry, in, uh, uh, sorry, it's about ASEAN integration, economic integration, uh, free market, and all that. He he don't really focus that much on that. Instead, he focus more on a a kind of um. Uh, a, 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 a kind of layer of, of freedom, the principle of freedom and social justice, and this is what human rights is all about. <laughs> and and another another part that I thought was really interesting is the beginning of his speech, and and uh, I mean the beginning of his speech. He he actually mentioned a lot about the. The, the principle of reconciliation, Gotung Royong, working together. And he didn't even make fun of his opponent, which is Prabowo and Hatta, uh, the, the, pre, the, the, supposed, the nominee for the president and vice president of the opposition. But instead, he recognizes them as his political competitor. And he recognized that in a healthy democracy, you should have a healthy competition between people doesn't mean that just because they are not on the same par when it comes to ideology they can't be in a healthy democracy competing with each other and for him to recognize his political opponent it shows a kind of political maturity with his party and himself and another thing he stressed on was interestingly also Gotong Royong to promote the um, Can you imagine our, mm. our Prime Minister mentioned the word Gotong Royong? No, he mentions GST. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sign of GST here, although Indonesia definitely is a country that has GST based on their past uh, economic policies. But if you, if you see, to him, a stronger nation it means that it has to have a strong institution and a strong people's mandate. In this, in this sense, con in, in this context, he's mentioning the constitution. He really recognizes the importance of the constitution, the importance of a transparent institution and a strong institution as well. And the best way for a government to run the country is when nobody feels neglected. Because if you look at Malaysia... There's always a lot of posts on Facebook or even interviews that's being conducted where people in the rural areas feel like the government is ignoring them, especially in Sabah and Sarawak. And <clears throat> usually when it comes to all the, the policies, the development, it's very um, centralized. It's, it's targeted for like the KL people, people who are already well uh, off. The urban, right. the urban And people who are not doing so well often feel like, hey, we cannot cope with this. Like, what about us? But the thing about Jokowi is that 
he specifically said, I want every citizen in this country to feel uh, <clears throat> in touch with the government and to feel like the government is doing something for them. And that is definitely a very, very important aspect when it comes to leading a country. Mm-hmm. And because Indonesia mm. focuses a lot on Gotong Royong working together, uh, this is another news that I thought it was interesting for us to highlight is Malaysia and Indonesia will join forces together to make ASEAN car a reality. That's right. We are going to have an ASEAN car. I don't know whether to laugh or cry, Dari. <laughs> <laughs> I well, mean, I, I like the idea of two nations working mm. together together for a car but the the thing is as we all know the history of proton it has not been that successful in terms of the execution partly because when it comes to state intervention mm-hmm. it doesn't create that free space but partly is also because of the way proton was being handled so for malaysia and indonesia to work together for an asian car because of our history, mm. we have this mixed re- mixed reaction whether it will work or not. Partly for the Indonesian side, will be like, oh, that's super awesome because they mm. never have any national car or ASEAN car in this matter. But they will probably, um, because there are two countries involved here, so probably Indonesia will be the one to uh, monitor the process. And they should probably get more countries involved if it's an ASEAN car, not just um, Malaysia and Indonesia. They could... Of course, try and bring Singapore in or or um, Thailand and uh, try and get more people involved. So the uh, they have more input from from different countries and then probably the product will be uh, better. Mm-hmm. I I I I, <laughs> yes, I guess still I have skeptical. mixed reaction. I'm sorry about it. It's not that I don't believe in the idea of ASEAN car, but I always believe that. When it comes to state intervention, especially in the Malaysian experience, it hasn't been that successful. So for them to join venture for an, an ASEAN car, it, it sounds a bit skeptical. In, uh, maybe because of the history, but I, I'm still keeping that optimistic, you know, that hope that maybe it will come true. Maybe state intervention is not such a bad thing. We, we it, It's just an idea yet. Uh, Jokowi has uh, shown his mm-hmm. interest to work together to pursue the idea as a reality, but we have to wait a couple more years to see that whether it will work or not. What's uh, what, what I'm really looking forward to is what they're gonna name the car. Is it just gonna be ASEAN car? Is it gonna be a, a local Indonesian oh, Malay? Please, please don't <laughs> name it a name that both of the country will be like, hey, that's Malaysian own name. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and then they'll be fighting over that as well. Then we'll be fighting over sate. <laughs> who, who started... <laughs> who who invented sate? Is it Indonesia or Malaysia? Anyway, talking about <coughs> talking about economic uh, intervention, so another, another news also by Indonesia. Indonesia's new president plans to... plans steepest fuel prices... price rises in nine years. So Jokowi also is a fan of less subsidy when it comes to fuel. Isn't it? Is it a good thing? Because for Malaysia, whenever the government wants to reduce the subsidy, people get very agitated about it. Yes, they do. But um, Jokowi has his uh, own uh, rational rationalization for it. And based on what he's trying to do here is that um, the... The proposal is to raise the gasoline price by 46% and diesel by 55%. And he, and the advisor said that it is safe to say that they are likely to do it within the first two weeks of actually taking over the office. Mm. But considering that he's such a mm. popular personality, for him to make unpopular move is not a big deal. Probably people would excuse him for that. Um, a lot of... Uh, a couple of years back, when Indonesians started to be to, to change from Suharto to a more democratic government, they also one of the the major thing that they did was to reduce the subsidy for fuel, and that actually helped Indonesia a lot uh, economically because you can save a, almost half of your subsidy um, percentage, especially when it comes to government's expenditure budget. 
and this when you have a reduced expenditure on subsidy then you can put money more on other forms of uh, restructuring or development so to save 13 percent which shows that indonesia is not really a high fuel consumption country compared to probably malaysia we actually save 21 percent and we only have 26 million um, uh, population so in a way that indonesia is definitely uh, thinking of the long term, how Indonesia can move forward with less burden on fuel subsidy. And in addition to that, Indonesian fuel prices is also actually one of the cheapest in the region. So lifting the subsidy doesn't really have uh, that much of an uh, impact on the people. How much is the price of subsidy? I mean, the price of gasoline there? It's about 6,500 rupiah a litre. And uh, diesel is about 5,500 uh, <coughs> 5, rupiah. How would that translate into Malaysia? <laughs> <coughs> well, you can say that um, 6,500 rupiah is about 2 ringgit. Mm-hmm. Because it's stated that 1 US mm-hmm. dollar is around 12,000 rupiah. So for 30,000, 30, is it? 30,000? The, the, the 1 liter of, of petroleum? For 1 liter, uh, it should be about... Two ringgit actually. Really? Almost the same price. We ours <coughs> is two ringgit and thirty cent. Yeah, almost the same price. So unpopular move by Jokowi. Something interesting and I think a lot of Indonesians are not really talking about it, partly because he's such a popular uh, she has such a popular personality. And uh, but Another unpopular a- area in Indonesia, so today we are like going <laughs> Indonesian over blast here, is French journalists detained in Papua appear in court. So the fate of two French journalists mm. detained for reporting on an outlaw independent movement, independence movement in Papua without the correct visa will be decided this week. Uh, this is uh, the fate of Thomas Dandois and Valentin Burat, who were arrested in Wamena on August 6, made their first appearance at Jayapura District Court yesterday. And they were charged because they were doing all this research in Papua, which was uh, apparently prohibited because it, for some reason it goes against the government when you go to Papua and do some, some um, deep research there. And also they tried to interview the West Papuan leader, Farkaros uh, you. Your yeah, boy Sembut, yeah. and also covering Say it again. um, <laughs> <laughs> Say his name again. to me now. <laughs> and they uh, were found with recorders, a video, a laptop, and mobile phones. And apparently, this is um, <coughs> a threat to their security. is considered a threat, so they will be um, considered for sentence for the maximum of five years in prison. Papua. <coughs> People, uh, Joko, they love Jokowi a lot. And in fact, he is a very popular leader when it comes to uh, minorities. And this would include the Papuans. But we have to wait like the next five years to really understand whether Jokowi would really change the policy uh, outside of Jakarta. He, would he respect the minorities outside of Jakarta? One of the reasons why Indonesia is unique is because of the combination of different regions. Uh, people always assume that Indonesia is a big island of people with the same face. But no, when you go to Papua, it's totally different culture. different. Even they have their own ethnic language. And to them, they... It's either for them to have to be self-determined, uh, to have self-determination, or for them to be able to be part of Indonesian society, but still have their own identity preserved. And these are the reason why there has been a lot of conflict, a lot of killings, even genocides way back then. So, And of course, it's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to actually uh, carry out the plan. So we'll have to see uh, if Jacobi really uh, does everything that he, that he promises to do. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> another area, this time we have to include another one country, which is about Singapore. And IMM says Singapore's foreign worker curbs could hurt competi- competitiveness and growth. So in Singapore uh, is being won by IMF. 
And this is not really good because Singapore has always been one of the economically uh, advanced nation compared to other uh, uh, Southeast Asian nation. And for Singapore's plan to cut reliance on foreign workers could reduce its competitiveness and growth potential while keeping core inflation elevated. This was uh, what IMF uh, said to them. They said that Singapore's plan to restructure its economy by trying to boost productivity and curb use of cheap labor, cheap foreign labor could eventually set the stage for a long period of sustainable growth. It's funny because it's actually a good thing for Singapore to cut its foreign labor and perhaps to focus more on growing their domestic workers. But now they are being faced with I am saying that hey, continue with uh, the cheap labors that you have so that you can be more competitive. It's funny for that to come out from IMF. So it shows that there, there is some sort of global conspiracy. Maybe it's not really uh, obvious, but it seems like the global capitalist world is about preserving the status quo in this case to preserve cheap foreign labors as part of the economic growth when the reality is it's definitely unsustainable and it doesn't gel well with human rights. And with that, that's all from us today. Uh, we hope that you enjoy the news. You can listen to us via our TuneIn app uh, when if you have your smartphone on. And of course, you can go to www.durianasian.com and also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and don't subscribe. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel.